Hello, I'm Jen Moore, Music of the Baroque's program annotator. Welcome to Baroque Notes, our virtual series of pre-concert talks. And welcome also to our 53rd season, a year we are calling Heaven and Earth, as so much of the music we're performing revolves around one of the main dualities of the Baroque era. The contrast between sacred music, or music written in the service of the church, and secular music, music that, well, isn't sacred. We're opening with two works written purely, or at least mostly in the case of one of them for sacred reasons, Johann Sebastian Bach's Magnificat and Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart's Requiem. What we think of as Western European classical music is a genre like rock or jazz. Within that genre are specific eras defined by certain composers, sounds, trends, and so forth. Bach's Magnificat was composed in the Baroque era, typically defined as starting in 1600 with the birth of opera and ending in 1750 with the death of Bach. That's how important he was. Bach wrote most of his sacred music while he was serving as cantor for the town of Leipzig. The hiring process in 1723 for the job of cantor is one of my favorite stories. The Leipzig Town Council offered it to two other composers before concluding that since the best could not be obtained, mediocre ones would have to be accepted. And this is how Johann Sebastian Bach got the job that gave rise to some of the most famous Baroque works ever composed. The position was demanding and Bach had to be much more than a good composer. In fact, of the 14 requirements outlined in the contract that he signed, only five make direct mention of music at all. Furthermore, Bach was required to fulfill all the musical needs of church and the city, producing music for the entire Lutheran liturgical calendar, as well as for other civic occasions upon request. By 1727, the composer had written at least three cycles of cantatas, about one a week. The St. John Passion, which we'll perform this coming March, and the Magnificat. The Virgin Mary's Hymn to God, My Soul Proclaims the Greatness of the Lord. The Magnificat centers on the Christian concept that whatever the circumstance, God will provide. Bach's musical setting of the text is relatively short compared to some of his other choral works, which makes it extremely expressive. But this probably had little to do with Bach's own artistic desire, however. As I mentioned, Bach's contract had many rules, and one of them was that the music he provided was not supposed to weigh down a church service that was already quite long. Despite having to work within this very practical constraint, Bach makes the works come to life in his setting. The rhythm of the word magnificat, for example, dictates the bounce of the opening chorus, creating a fanfare-like gesture that highlights the sentiment of praise. Music evokes specific words, almost literally, an effect that is known as word painting. The powerful chorus, Omnis Generaciones, depicts a single phrase through sheer repetition, effectively emphasizing all generations. 
This chorus is also a good example of imitation or counterpoint, a musical texture very popular in the Baroque period in which identical or similar musical lines enter one after the other, creating a complicated, almost tapestry-like effect. <laughs> uses music in the Magnificat to bring words to life in so many ways, and this is where my focus will be during the performance. Mozart's Requiem, on the other hand, is part of the classical era, which falls roughly between 1750, as the style associated with Mozart and Haydn began to flourish, and 1820, when Beethoven's late symphonies broke many of the rules about musical form. Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart's Requiem is up there with Vivaldi's Four Seasons as one of the most famous classical works, partly because of the mythology made famous in Peter Schaeffer's play and the subsequent movie Amadeus. As the story goes, Mozart reluctantly accepts a commission from a mysterious black-robed figure and gradually becomes convinced that he is being poisoned by his colleague Antonio Salieri, and that the piece he is writing, a requiem or mass for the dead, is actually for his own funeral. He wants to abandon the project, but mounting debts force him to continue. At the end, Mozart is too weak even to copy the music himself, and it is his nemesis, the mediocre Salieri, who conveniently arrives on the scene to help him commit his final musical utterance to paper. Where did I stop? At the end of the recordare. Statuens in parte so, next. So now, confutatus, confutatus maledictus, get it confounded, flamis acrobis edictus. How would you translate that? Consigned to flames of war. Do you believe in it? What? Fire which never dies, burning you forever. Oh, yes. Possible. Come, let's begin. We ended in F major. Yes. So now, A minor. A minor. Yes. Confutatis. A minor. Start with the voices. Basses first. Second beat of the first measure. Time, time. Common time. Second beat of the first measure. On A. Second measure, second beat. Maledictus. You see? Yes, yes, G sharp. Of course. Yes. Second beat of the third measure. On E. Famis acribus adictis, rest. Maledictis, famis acribus adictis. You have me? I think so. Show me. Now the tenors. Fourth beat of the first measure on C. Confutatis. Second measure, fourth beat, D. Maledictis. All right. Yes, 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 continue. Second beat of the fourth measure on F. Now the orchestra. Second bassoon and bass trombones with the basses, identical notes and rhythm. First bassoon, tenor trombones with the tenors. Don't go too fast. Do you have it? Don't go too fast. Do you have it? First bassoon, tenor trombone, what? With the tenors. It's an amazing story, and most of it is not true. 
What is true, Mozart almost certainly believed Salieri was a lesser composer. As a result of his illness, which was real, he may have believed someone was poisoning him. We know that he was paranoid. And a mysterious figure indeed lurked behind the composition, an emissary of a man named Count of Franz Valseg Stupak, a wealthy would-be composer who bought works by more talented musicians and passed their creations off as his own. Valseg Stupak planned the Requiem to be a personal tribute to his recently deceased wife. He gave Mozart a significant amount of money up front with a promise of more, but the composer kept abandoning the work and never finished the commission. On December 4th, 1791, in the early afternoon, three singers arrived at Mozart's bedside to sing through the completed portions of the Requiem, the composer himself taking the alto line. When they reached the Lacrimosa, Mozart put the work aside. He died just before 1 a.m. the following morning. Constanza, Mozart's widow, was left with an incomplete requiem and a significant problem. Without the product, there would be no payment and she would have to return the advance she had received. Ever the entrepreneur, which she was, Constanza asked Mozart's favorite student, Josef Leopold von Eibler, to complete the piece. Eibler initially agreed, but later backed out. Somewhat ironically, Eibler late died of a stroke in 1833 while conducting a performance of the Requiem. Constanza then turned to Franz Sussmeyer, who was not only Mozart's student, meaning that he knew the composer's style reasonably well, but also his copyist, meaning he could forge his handwriting. We don't know exactly how much of the Requiem Sussmeyer wrote. The general theory is that Mozart completed the introitus in Kyrie. He sketched out the sequence, although only eight measures of the lacrimosa and the offertorium. Sussmeyer, therefore, completed the lacrimosa and composed the Sanctus Benedictus and Agnus Dei movements. Sussmeyer then forged the composer's autograph on the front page, misdating it 1792, which was a year after Mozart died, and the complete Requiem was handed over to Valseg Stupak. Musically, a somber, doleful mood and a retrospective style characterize the Requiem. The low woodwinds are one of the primary ingredients in achieving this tone. In particular, the basset horns, a low clarinet whose name derives from the Bavarian term for small bass and bassoons heard from the beginning of the work.
Several sections of the Requiem use the imitative texture we heard in the clip from Bach's Magnificat, as in the Kyrie. <laughs> However, one of the most dramatic moments, the Dies Irae, employs a more straightforward single voice texture, which is the musical style that became more fashionable over the course of the 18th century. <laughs> Also noteworthy are the final sections of the Mass, set to music Susmea ripped from the beginning, which we know Mozart composed and orchestrated. While some scholars have complained that this is a bit of a cheap trick, musicologist Stanley Sadie notes wisely that it at least ensures that the Requiem ends in fully authentic tones. <laughs> Bach's only setting of Mary's Hymn of Praise in the Requiem Mass Mozart was writing when he died are both extremely compelling works, but in very different ways and for very different reasons. I hope my comments have helped make your listening experience a little more meaningful and that you'll join us next in October for Viva Vivaldi, our celebration of one of the great composers of the Italian Baroque. Thank you so much. Oh, darkness.